Okay. Well, hello everyone. I'm very happy to see you all here today. Uh, I'm glad you're here to celebrate our um, Kate and Kingsley Tufts winners. Uh, we have a full program for you, so I'm going to begin. Um, as you know, I'm Wendy Martin. I'm director of the Tufts Poetry Awards program. And uh, in the past few years, my special effort has been to uh, try to create as much increased visibility uh, for these awards as possible. And I've had um, several adventures along the way, uh, which some of which have been a lot of fun and some of them have been, um, well, amusing. Um, so, for example, earlier this spring, I attended the Association of Writers and Writing Programs Conference in Seattle to help publicize the Tufts Awards. And I arrived with a suitcase full of brochures um, describing the awards, and I proceeded to, to visit every publisher's booth. And uh, that was no small feat, um, as there were 700 publishers at this conference, much to my surprise. I had no idea it was going to be so large. And there were 13,000 people in attendance. So in contrast to the other many, many conferences I've been to over the years, uh, the American Writers, um, Writers and Writing Programs Conference is uh, really epic in scale for nor North America. It's the largest North American conference. And it was a great pleasure. I went around to all the booths and I told everyone about the $100,000 award for a mid-career poet and the $10,000 award for the first book. And as you can imagine, all the publishers who didn't know about it were very excited to hear about the good news. And um, the second day I was at the conference, I was getting a little tired, but I was persisting. I handed the brochure to a young man at one of the booths, and he promptly threw it on the floor and said to me, gatekeeper. And um, <laughs> I, I, I've never been treated this way at a conference before, so I uh, wasn't quite sure what to do. I took a deep breath, I retrieved the brochure, and um, uh, asked him what he meant by calling me a gatekeeper. And uh, before long, we got into a civilized conversation about uh, limited distribution channels and crowdsourcing and, and so on and so forth. And, and as I got ready to leave, uh, the young man asked me if indeed could he have a Tufts brochure, please? Um, so of course I gave it to him. <laughs> um, then the second adventure was a lot more fun. Um, last November, I was on the subway in Manhattan on my way um, to visit my editor at Pantheon, and directly across from me was a selection from Poetry and Motion. And though if those of you who don't know the Manhattan subways, um, every few months there's a new poem that's posted in a large uh, format, easy to read. Um, and uh, so I, as I always do, I started to read the poem. Um, and this program was launched by the uh, Poetry Society of America and the Metropolitan um, Transit Authority, the MTA in um, uh, 1992. And as Google will tell you, a Poetry in Motion is one of the most uh, successful and popular literary programs in American history. And certainly, Poetry in, in Motion has enabled me to read many poems on the New York subways uh, in the past 22 years, um, since it was founded. So as usual, I read the poem. I'm sort of looking at it, and well, Whenever I look out of, at snowy, whenever I look out at the snowy mountains at this hour and speak directly into the ear of the sky, it's you I'm thinking of. You're like the spirits the children invent to inhabit the stuffed horse and the doll. I don't know who hears me. I don't know who speaks when the horse speaks. And as I'm coming to the last line, I realize with great excitement that this poem was from a book that won the Kingsley Tufts Award in 2011, Horses Where the Answers Should Have Been by Chase Twitchell. And indeed, um, after the last line, there was Chase's name. Uh, so I read the poem again and again, and I'm becoming increasingly enthusiastic about the fact that the Tufts Poetry Award is in the, in the New York subways, and how, how much better can this get? Because I'm a, I worked and taught in New York for a long time, and I love the place, and now I'm out here, and I love this place, and I, somehow they all came together in that moment. And I was getting more and more excited, and then suddenly I realized um, uh, uh, with some embarrassment that the man seated underneath the poster directly across from me thought I was trying to get his attention. 
And so, uh, you know, I quickly said to him, I, I know this poet, I know this poet. So then he began reading the poem. And then people saw that he was reading the poem, so they came over and they began reading the poem. And then when I got off at my stop at Broadway, there was quite a crowd, about eight or 10 people reading Chase's poem. So I thought to myself, well, rumors to the contrary, poetry does get around. And certainly the visibility of the Tufts Awards is increasing quite dramatically. Uh, this year when CGU announced the winners for 2014, the Associated Press, the LA Times, uh, National Public Radio, the Boston Globe, the Baltimore Sun, and more than 200 other media outlets reported the announcement. The success is largely due to the outstanding work of Rod Levesque in CGU media relations, and we have much to thank him for uh, in regard to raising the profile of the Tufts Poetry Awards. So I think we are you know, definitely uh, on an upward trajectory. I, I think Tufts is definitely getting around and um, it's very, very exciting to be involved with this program. Um, before I begin uh, to today's proceedings, um, I want to thank a few people. Um, uh, President Freund uh, for her support and Tammy Schneider for hers. And um, I'd also like to thank Susan Hampson uh, who is uh, in Arts and Humanities as a, uh, a program administrator, and she's just been extraordinary in her support. And also I want to thank our new um, uh, administrative assistant uh, for the uh, special events and Tufts Awards, uh, Genevieve um, Kaplan, and she's been wonderful as well. She's new to the job, and, and I just want to give them both a round of applause. And, um, now, um, uh, uh, President Deborah Freund would like to say a few words of welcome, as would uh, Tammy Schneider, the Dean of Arts and Humanities. Welcome to CGU, and welcome to one of the most important poetry prizes in the world and welcome to what is certainly, I believe, the signature event of CGU every year. Congratulations, I really look forward to talking with both of you tonight. Today's event celebrates the spirit of poetry and CGU cherishes the opportunity to sustain the legacy of Kate and Kingsley Tufts and their love and respect for poetry. I only wish I had known them as President McGuire did. With us today are members of the CGU Board of Trustees, the members of the Arts and Humanities Board of Advisors, and loyal friends of poetry from all of our campuses, and we welcome you here today. Many of this, this royalty who have such loyalty to poetry are people who are donors, who help us create create the transformative educational experience that we know we offer at CGU. Thank you for all of those gifts, and thank you for the gifts from our students, our faculty, and those who love the Claremont Colleges who are here today. It's my pleasure now to introduce a very, very wonderful woman, the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities, my friend and yours, Tammy Schneider. Thank you. Yes, Jericho, she was talking about me. Um, and I need to apologize before I read my pathetic statements because I always try and write something up and then I go to the poetry panel and I leave thinking I have no ability to use the English language with any dexterity after having heard a panel of poets and people who study and love poetry and have discussed all the, the ins and outs and things that matter. And so since I left today's panel, I just keep thinking of all of these things. And so anything that I have written by definition is paling in comparison to anything that we heard on that panel and anything that you are about to hear. So let me, this is my mea culpa in advance, if I may. Um, that said, I love Tufts, the whole everything about it. It shapes the academic year of the School of Arts and Humanities 
from the summer and the spring where we contact all the publishers, as Wendy's already done, um, asking them to send us their books, to the onslaught of all the books coming in, to sending them out, which is no small task, um, to, um, and we send them to our amazing panel of preliminary judges. And yes, Jericho, I want you to do the victory dance that we discussed earlier. Um, uh, they read approximately 300 volumes of poetry. Um, to the weekend when the preliminary panel comes to town and actually narrows that list of 300 down to two categories of 25 for each prize. To the party immediately after, celebrating the achievement of whittling down such a list, which just gives us another opportunity to talk about words and poetry and what does it all mean. To the sending out of those remaining books um, to our next panel of judges, when they too come a few months later to deliberate on whittling that list of 25 down to one, to the day when they are locked in a room to deliberate all day, um, and um, Wendy has told me that to be a fly on the wall of that conversation would truly be a joy for everybody. Um, this year, they weren't locked in a, in a closed dark room because most of them came from somewhere affected by the polar vortex, and so they reveled in the open windows and walked around, um, yay California, um, to the party that night, and you can see we like our parties here, um, and at that party, we actually have the opportunity to call the poets and tell them um, that their achievements have been recognized, um, and that is truly um, a great moment. We talked earlier about how um, at the panel, about how um, you know they don't do victory dances after um, poems are read, and there's not usually um, outrageous applause, etc. But um, my comment there was this year after the pauses that we received from our um, our poets after learning that they had won, and there was a, a great lengthy pause after their poems were read at the dinner, and that was more um, a testament to how moved all of us were by what we had heard. Um, to finally, today, when we had a panel talking about the aspects of poetry with poets from Claremont, judges of the Tufts um, award process, and this year's winning poets. But this year reminds me too how often other influences shape the poets and their poetry. This year, both of our winners um, are participants in the Cave Canem, which is a, a society, a, a group of African American poets who have a training weekend, um, and it moves around the country. Did I convey this well enough? Right, and Jericho's also a fellow. Um, and this was established originally in 1996, and Afa was one of the original um, mentors of that program. And Yona was one of his original mentees of this really, truly important um, program where poets have an opportunity to talk and be mentored and probably mentor each other. Um, as um, uh, Yonan uh, noted last night to me, I did not think anything could make winning the Kate Prize any better until I learned that Afa, my teacher and mentor, had won the Kingsley. So 17, late, 17 years later, these two poets have come together again, having shaped each other, their poetry, and through that, all of us. And so, after I am quite confident that after hearing our poets today, you will agree with me, a la our discussion earlier today, that poetry truly does matter, as hearing poetry gives us insight into how others see the world, which cannot help but uh, change our vision of that world. So thank you for coming. Thank you to the poets, both our winners and the others, for continuing to write. And um, please enjoy the rest of the festivities. Thank you. Um, I also like to express appreciation to three Tufts judges who are rotating off the judging committees this year. Tammy has just given you an idea of the um, heavy responsibility they, they have, and it's, it's a lot of work to be on these committees. Um, Ted Genoways uh, is rotating off the final uh, Tufts Judging Committee, and uh, he's a poet uh, who, and a contributing writer, he's a poet, he's a contributing writer at Mother Jones, and an editor at large um, for On Earth. This is the magazine of the Natural Resources Defense Council. His essays on poetry have appeared in The Atlantic, Harper's, The New Republic, Outside, Poetry, The Washington Post, Book World. 
He is also the author, author of two books of poems and the literary here, history of Walt Whitman and the Civil War, which the Richmond Times Dispatch wrote um, fills a major gap in previous biographies of Whitman. Genoway's book, The Chain, Farm, Factory, and the Fate of Our Food, is forthcoming from Harper Collins uh, in the fall of 2014. And his many awards include fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Guggenheim Foundation, and inclusion in the Pushcart Prize Anthology and Best American Travel Writing. He was the editor of the Virginia Quarterly Review from 2003 to 2012, during which time the magazine won six national uh, awards. The second judge who is rotating off the final judging committee is Carl Phillips. Carl is a professor of English and of Afro-American Studies at Washington University in St. Louis, and he also teaches in the creative writing program there. He's the author of more than 12 books of poetry, including The Tether, published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, and this was the winner of the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award in 2002. In addition to the Kingsley Tufts Prize, Carl has been awarded the Theodore, Theodore Rethke Memorial Foundation Poetry Prize and the Tom Gunn Award. He has also been a finalist for the National Book Award and the National Books Critics Circle Award, as well as the winner of the Samuel French Morse Poetry Prize. Um, Carl has also had many other Ar 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 honors, including the 2006 Academy of American Poets Fellowship, uh, an award uh, in literature from the American Academy of the Arts and Letters, the Pushcart Prize, the Academy of American Poets Prize, the induction to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the Library of Congress. And Carl has told me that having won the Kingsley Tufts Prize was a gateway prize, and then after that, he, as Kate and Kingsley Tufts intended, he, he had increasing intention, intention and uh, more and more opportunities, was able to write more, and was recognized by a wider and wider uh, range of critics and readers. Um, now, Ted and Carl aren't able to be here today, but I hope you'll join me in applauding both of them in absentia for their outstanding work on the Tufts Final Judging Committee, as well as for their accomplishments in general. The third Tufts judge we are honoring today is Jericho Brown. And Jericho is, um, was the chair and served on the preliminary judging committee for five years. This is the committee that reads the 300 plus submissions that Tammy was talking about for both the Kingsley and Kate Tufts Awards. Uh, this committee winnows the list to 30 submissions to forward to the final judging committee, which selects the finalists and winners. So that's a heck of a lot of reading, and, and it has to be done in two or three months at most. It's, it's a very, very demanding job. Jericho Brown is a poet whose work has received wide praise. His first collection of poetry, Please, published in 2008, won the American Book Award. His work has won other honors, as well as including the Whiting Writers Award and a 2009-10 fellowship from Radc the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. He's also won a National Endowment for the Arts Award, that's a fellowship for poetry, and he is a professor uh, first at the University of San Diego until 2012, uh, and then uh, at Emory University. I've asked Jericho to say a few words um, to you about the judging process uh, and the Tufts Awards in general and whatever else he might want to say. Okay. Hi, I'll make this fast because I know you want to get to the poetry. That's what we love, right? We love the poetry. Uh, this has been, um, this has been a lot of hard work, and so talk. You know, and it's really hard to talk about hard work because nobody really wants to hear about <laughs> you and your hard work. Um, but in spite of the fact that it was hard work, it was also very fulfilling work. I think I learned more about reading than um, over these last three years, um, doing the, the prejudging for the, the, the Tufts. I learned more about reading than I ever could have while I was getting a PhD. Uh, the process itself is a process by which hopefully we begin getting books in August, hopefully. 
and, um, and meet in December, hopefully. And, and at that meeting, we, we come, each of us, the three of us um, this year, the other two judges were Jennifer Chang and Charles, Charles Altieri. Past judges that I've served with include Suji Kwak Kim and Andrew Feld. When we have that meeting, we fight and we agree and we, uh, we cry and we read each other poems and we show just how excited we are about a book and we talk about this tradition we love so much and why it makes a difference in our lives and how each book changes or challenges that tradition or contributes to that tradition. And then in that conversation, through that conversation, we come up with a list of 25 books in each, ca each category and for each of those lists to, uh, to the final judges. Uh, the major joy, uh, and 300 books, by the way, um, if we get the books in August, is, a, is about two books a day, um, two books of poetry a day. Um, and what it has done for me has allowed me to understand just how varied and vast this art is and just how important it is not only to those who make it, but to those who read it. Um, and it has indeed changed my own work and made me more and more certain that poetry is indeed a living and thriving thing on this planet. Uh, so I'm really glad to have had this opportunity and I am really particularly proud of these winners today. I'm so glad all these black people here. <laughs> I, will, I know I'm not supposed to say nothing about that. But I know I'm supposed to act like y'all don't see that. I know, I know everybody's like, oh, he's black too. But, um, <laughs> you know, I've been an admirer of, of the work of, um, I've been an admirer of the work of Yona Harvey and of Alpha Michael Weaver from the very beginning. I'm going to say this without crying, I swear to God. Um, and they have been two people, two poets, uh, whose work has meant a great deal um, to my life and to my own work, but they have been two people who have meant a great deal to my life. Um, there, there, there are some folks, and y'all know this, there are some folks you don't talk to every day, but it's just good to know that they're alive. And uh, these, these two people are two of those people. Uh, and when they write something, they write it because they mean it. And um, so I'm glad that they wrote books good enough to for get forwarded. <laughs> and I'm glad those people at the other end decided that they should indeed win these prizes today. So thank y'all so much, and I hope you enjoy today. Um, finally, I'm sad to say that Chase Twitchell, who is chair of the final judging committee, um, isn't able to be with us today. Um, something came up at the last minute that um, uh, prevented her from coming. Uh, but she has asked me to um, introduce this year's winners uh, on her behalf, and she's also sent a few words of appreciation uh, to them, and she's asked me to read them as well. Uh, as you all know, uh, the winner of the Kate Tufts um, uh, Prize Award is Yona Harvey for Hemming the Water, published by Four Way Books. Yona Harvey received a BA from Howard University, an MFA from The Ohio State University, and a Master of Library and Information Science degree from the University of Pittsburgh. Currently, she's an assistant professor of English at the University of Pittsburgh, where she also serves as the department head of the undergraduate creative writing program. Yona has published poems in numerous literary journals, including Jubilat, Gulf Coast, Kalalu, Plowshares, and West Branch, and was the recipient of an individual artist grant from the Pittsburgh Foundation. 
One of the major influences in her work has been the composer and jazz pianist Mary Lou Williams, whose music is a fusion of the spiritual and the secular. A fascination with mixing of disparate ingredients is a hallmark of Yona's work. Uh, here's a quotation from a re recent interview with Yona. Typically drafted by some method of collage or sampling, my work has been described as nonlinear and occasionally mimics song arrangements and folk tales. I enjoy making found poems and centos, and cento is a literary work in which words from various authors are interspliced. And I am drawn to new patterns in language and thought. I feel emboldened by the potentiality of multiple lives for literature, writing that can exist on the traditional printed page and in electronic format, or transition to another genre. My first poetry collection, Hemming the Water, speaks to the futility of trying to mend or straighten a life that constantly changes. In that book, I attempt to redirect the distractions of motherhood, marriage, and daily routine by employing them through sound and rhythm. To this description, Chase would like to add that Yona Harvey is a poet of endless surprises who can, can rhyme baptismal with ab abysmal within a single line, who can transform an American flag into a powerful emblem of loss and longing in only 14 lines, and who can range from here to outer space and back by way of family, the devil, the pleasures of language, and the predicament of death. In a recent interview uh, with, with Yona again, Michael Alessi wrote, to hear her voice, which has a unique, so close to a song I can't describe it quality, an intonation which taps into the undercurrents of musicality below the surface of the language that you didn't realize were there is transformative. Deborah Freund and I would like to um, give, give Yona her check and, um, and, and a little present, and then she will read from her poem. So if you'd both come up, um, we will give you the money. <laughs> to Yona, with great appreciation, enthusiasm for all you do, and a hearty congratulations, and I can't wait to hear you read. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure there's something from Tiffany's as well. <laughs> oh, that's such a big bag. <laughs> and, and I, I just said, here's a little something from Tiffany's. And Jericho, we didn't forget you. You also have something from yeah, Tiffany's. Something. <laughs> you do. You do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to set my timer. Um, I feel like all of the people have been thanked, but I want to just do it again. Thank you to the Claremont community, the judges. Thank you for taking such good care of us while we've been here. Um, I know I said this before, but I have been thanked for so many things, like picking my kids up and being a good spouse and daughter and all those things, and that's good. Uh, but I don't think anybody has ever thanked me for being a poet like someone did over the phone when I heard about this award. and. <laughs> I just, it's hard to describe what that means. I'm very comfortable and at home in poetry. I love it so much, so to be acknowledged for that is very special, so thank you. Um, I'm just gonna read. Oh, no, I thank my mom too. <laughs> I gotta thank my mother. She said, um, 
you know, she called me before I came here and she said, they think you're a promising poet. That's very important, that's good, but that means they want you to keep working. So I'm gonna do that too. <coughs> to describe my body walking. To describe my body walking, I must go back to my mother's body walking with an aimless switch in this moment of baptismal snow or abysmal flurry. There's a shadow of free fall frenzy and her unhurried the way snowflakes are unhurried toward transformation at my living room window. She moves unlabored. She will not ask me to invite her in, but she will expect it. I will open the door to her. She is my mother, even if she is made of snow and ice and air and the repetition of years, a means, a ways. She came out of trees surrounding me. I see her cross, now the creek in her patent leather shoes, their navy glimmer like a slick hole I might peer over and fall into against so much snow, weighing down the prayerful arms of sycamores, which doused the bushes last autumn. Her little hearse broke down near the exit that leads to my house. Now she must walk. She will be tired. I will let her in, though she will not ask. She has come so far past the mud and twigs, the abandoned nests. This time of year, she can't tell the living from the dead. The pathway is mostly still, except for her moving with the snow, becoming the snow. Forgiveness, she is a stamp in it the tapping of boots at the porch steps, not spring or summer, just her advancing, multiplying, falling through branches. There's a flurry of her. Mother love, because you are not April or June or January or slush caked boots or snow falling or melting or moving in from the northwest plains, one cold coffee of a late night, my bruise, my blade, my thorn, I love here. In the fold of a cramped journal, I've nothing to whine about, to hate, or to feel indifferent to. I write with the ink that is your name, dark blood in the droop of a pale handkerchief. When the baker runs her hands against the smooth flour and sugar tins with their satisfied lids. She is not like you. She is not your sewing machine in danger of falling over the edge, no. You're at least 13 clocks in the span of two rooms, each off by a minute or two. Lord, help me when they chimed, and so my love is awkward and ill-timed. Here's the oversized window you keep looking out of. What trip 
Are you planning, you never punctual, retired secretary, you flat-ended film, you holy shock of self-absorption, polyester panties, cotton-knit pajamas, you paper jam, you yesterday, you minister of excuses, you tardy bell, parcel package, unexpected visitor, unanswered phone call, shout from the basement, rainstorm, static in the busted speaker, hearing aid, headache, cabinet void of tea bags and measuring cups, passive aggressive stomach ache, one and a half minutes too long, day late, dollar short, mother of mothers, you mother you. Mothers, they're so complicated. <laughs> I think, though, poetry teaches me compassion. We talked about what poetry does, why it matters. Mm. The shape compassion takes. Until a moment ago, maybe its bands were great fish chanting in water, the sound of Mabius more hypnotic than paper, striving to be infinite and classic, like famous whales or wannabe singers. And then I turned my head to a page in a book. I was 11 or 12. It was a lesson on the verb to be, or it was a lesson about creation. I was 16 or 17. What did I know about DNA or the birthplaces of King, Gandhi, and Sappho? How quickly can you locate Atlanta, Poor Bandar, or Lesbos on a map? I tried to resist puritanical answers. I tried to trust what my head could accomplish. I was 19 or 21. I wasn't ignoring the elephant in the room, but gazing upon its magnificent toenails, the fossilized history between them. I was 27 or 28. I spoke often to myself. In an emergent process, two is more than twice as many as one. Do not fear this idea there was you born to a certain family of a certain city, and then there was you becoming another woman entirely, speaking in the antelope's voice, or was it the jackal's? When a herd mourns a fallen calf in the plain, the youngest survivor circles back to bless her sister. She suspects the body will take the form of a dragonfly or maybe the shape compassion takes. You can speak of this if you want. Give yourself permission. It's hard to know. It's hard not to loop back toward those daydream-inspired turns at the front of a storm-colored schoolroom where no one, not even the teacher, was listening. I was 33 or 34. I wanted God, I wanted science to predict, explain, intervene, but she couldn't or he wouldn't or it wouldn't, and so I sat, not paralyzed, but something like it, lukewarm on gospel, a loose shell in a tambourine waiting for rapture. Um, <laughs> I have to read this poem, Hurricane, because um, <laughs> it's like uh, being here. There's all these people who I've known for so long, and they're so supportive, and I don't know. I'm standing here in Claremont, but my head is a hundred different places, and for me, I don't know, that's what writing is like, and particularly this poem. Uh, I wrote it for my daughter, who was born in 
New Orleans, which is also where I met Jericho, and that my daughter loves her some Jericho. <laughs> but also in Pittsburgh, there's a little carnival that comes to town every year in the spring, and it's a little rinky-dink carnival, but there's a ride there called the Hurricane. And um, one spring when my daughter was really small, she wanted to get on this ride, and her brother and me and her father were looking like, there's no way in hell I'm getting on that ride. And so while we were arguing about it, she just put her hand up and said, just, I'll go. I'll just go by myself. So, and that's when I started to write this poem. Hurricane. Four tickets left, I let her go. First born into a hurricane. I thought she escaped the flood waters. No, but her head is empty of the drowned for now, though she took her first breath below sea level. Ah, ah, and ah, mama, let me go. She speaks what every smart child knows. To get grown, you unlatch your hands from the groan and up and up and up and up. She turns latched in the seat of a hurricane. You let your girl what? You let your girl what I did so she do, I did so she do, so girl, you can ride a hurricane. And she do, and she do, and she do, and she do, she do make my river an ocean. Memorial, Baptist, Protestant, birth. My girl walked away from a hurricane. And she do, and she do, and she do, and she do. She do take my hand a while longer. The haunts in my pocket I'll keep to a hum. Katrina was a woman I knew. When you were an infant, she rained on you, and she do, and she do, and she do, and she do. Thank you. So it's really wonderful to read in front of Afa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Open-toed shoes. Mm. Figure one. Shoes worn once with collapse intuited. A. Heel. 2.5 inches wooden faux. I'd never fallen on a stage, on a sidewalk, in a bad relationship. Never. Not a single heartbreak. Sneakers and sandals, tomboy wanderer, method. Stay low to the ground. The break would wait plus B. Toes absent, bent from two small shoes, from two small budgets, from a too long 
childhood. C. And here one must step outside the figure. And here one must leap, dream signs, dream, vi dream visions, and so forth. Full grown, I landed in Houston and shopped with a man not shown. You look so different, I said to him. There was blue between us. Those shoes, he asked when I lifted them. Yes, I said, and slipped them on. Yes to their blue dust straps. Yes to the box, to the bag, and yes to figuring where to wear them. Figure two, April, the space where one and is led into it into it, into it. She fell, they answered when I asked what happened. And one week later, into the grove she went while I stood in these shoes, these shoes. Time to read <laughs> Did you say read the Frida Kahlo poem? <laughs> uh, that's funny. I'll read that because Jericho said that. Because he's a troublemaker. Turquoise. And then the woman who wants to sleep with my husband sends him a card with Frida Kahlo's sepia face peering through it. And he begins reading the note aloud to me as if the words might bring the woman back across the line she crossed that summer he mentioned her name for the first time. Then I think his brush with temptation isn't as noble as he'd like to believe. More like cleaning the house when it gets dirty. He could mark it on a table of triumphs, but at the end of the day, it mostly amounts to what he is supposed to do. <laughs> Men are so clueless sometimes which isn't a revelation, but occasionally needs restating and brings to mind something I read about Lenny Kravitz, who composed penitent lyrics for Lisa Bonet, how he believed the pair might reconcile as soon as Bonet heard the album he dedicated to her. I am clueless sometimes too, like the woman who cried to me on a campus bench that she wanted to be an artist, to travel, while the others rushed to lunch, to more classes, and what should she do? Then I thought, we are always asking questions whose answers we already know, and that is a great necklace she's wearing, which I told her, but she recoiled when I said, wearing turquoise jewelry and Frida Kahlo skirts doesn't make women artists which was probably the cruelest thing I'd ever said to a young woman, but exactly how I felt watching her fuss over the ruffles of her long black skirt. These days, Frida Kahlo appears like a god to whom I've prayed, like accessories that shake at the bottom of a woman's shopping bag, a loose divinity of feel-good postcards and magnets rocking on paper handles in the, cre in the crease of an upright arm. This is what I think when I ask my husband to stop reading the note he wants to render harmless. Does a woman's affection for Frida make her my comrade? Years ago, with my head wrapped and bracelets jangling, I might have answered yes. But when I ask, who's Lupe, who's Frida, Who's Diego? I can't help but conclude 
Someone's at work on a grand cliche I'm supposed to buy into. And there's nothing harmless about Frida Kahlo, exquisite painter of stitches and steel, thorns and wombs and vaginas. Something utterly misleading about Frida's face on a four by four note card, a little too neat and too square, which makes sense in the American sense of matinee love or lust or art or what passes for art or living the life of an artist, those heroes and heroines dangling over the cliffs of vanity, begging for a little more rope. Thank you. This year's Kingsley Tufts winners, winner is Afa Michael Weaver for the Government of Nature. And um, as you know, uh, the check he is about to receive is in that envelope, and it is $100,000. I probably shouldn't tell you this because who knows what might happen between here and dinner. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, we will um, um, give it to you right now, and then, and, then, uh, and then I'll have you sit while I read uh, Chase's words. Come on up. Afa, yes. I offer you hearty congratulations. I want to also congratulate you on your protege's incredible reading. Uh, I almost want to say, can you top that? <laughs> and you know, know what? <laughs> we're all going to listen, and we're so proud, and I'm so proud to award this to you. Congratulations from all of us Thank and from you. the whole world who reads you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you sit down? Maybe? Sure. I will, I will introduce you. Okay. That's your Tiffany bag. Okay. Um, Afa Michael Weaver is a native of Baltimore, where he was a factory worker for 15 years before winning an NEA fellowship, attending uh, and attending graduate school at Brown University. In a recent interview. He describes his time there. He says, it was an earthquake, super tsunami kind of shift in my life. 300 foot waves and tremors that could level cities the size of Atlanta hit me. Uh, clearly, uh, it was an important experience. Uh, since then, uh, Afa has been a poetry pioneer in many different capacities. He taught the first graduate course in black poetry ever at NYU, and as he has said, um, I developed it, the very first black poetry that ever had been taught at NYU at the graduate level. From its inception, he has been involved with Cave Canem, uh, which means beware of the dog, uh, as you all I'm sure know. Um, and this is an organization, as Tammy you said, uh, that was founded in 1996 by Cornelius Eady and Toy Derricote to create what they have described as a home for the many voices of African American uh, poetry. Afa has said, I treasure my relationship with Kave Kanem and I'm so happy to see it as a revitalizing energy uh, in American poetry and American culture. It has the potential for showing America that the greatest realization of its democratic principles comes when marginalized cultures are allowed to cultivate within the context of their own experiences and through writing out of this interior life bring to democratic energies a group of poets and artists who can participate and live with the rest of us as integrated beings. And when we are blessed further with generosity and compassion, this country will have the best chance that it can possibly have. Rooted in two very cult different traditions, Western and Eastern, Afa's work is a forceful and unnerving blend of the spiritual, political, and personal. 
In spite of the traumas of childhood, racism, and personal loss, his poems have about them a rare openness and a tenderness toward the reader that are disarming. They are elegant, subtle, musically complex, and deeply passionate. They are truth-telling poems of the highest order. The Government of Nature uh, is Afa's 12th collection. His work has received two Pushcart Awards, a May Sarton Award, the PDI Award in Playwriting from the ETA Creative Arts Foundation, grants from the Pennsylvania Council of Arts and the Pew Foundation, as well as a Fulbright appointment to Taiwan. As a translator, Afa works in Chinese. Since, he told me last night, Mandarin. Um, since 1998, he has taught at Simmons College in Boston, where he is the alumni professor of English and director of the Zora Neale Hurston Literary Center. He also shares the Simmons College International, uh, he also chairs the Simmons College International Poetry Conference. Please join me in welcoming Afa Weaver and to hear his poems. When uh, Chase called me that Saturday evening, I thought that someone, some of my poet friends were playing a joke on me. <laughs> and she said, this is Chase Twitchell. I said, the poet? And she said, yes. <laughs> and um, I, all I could say was thank you. And um, I'm saying that again to everyone here this evening, um, people I'm meeting for the very first time, uh, friends and family are here. Thank you so much. And um, thanks for, uh, or thanks to everyone who has been engaged in uh, my sometimes difficult struggle with life. And I think my family knows that better than anyone. Thanks to Claremont and to the administrators of the Kingsley Tufts Award. And let me say about being the, uh, the elder or the first elder of Cave Canem that I'm always happy to see the fellows succeed. So it, I was really happy to sit there and listen to, to Yona. Whenever I see Mr. Brown in the news, I think, I feel something here, you know? And that's part of my job as, a, as a, the first elder in Cave Canem. So keep going, you know, keep going. I'm going to read from the government of nature, of course, and uh, the, the book began in Taiwan in a monastery. I was teaching Tai Chi to the nuns in Hualien on the east coast of Taiwan. I called my teacher and I said, is it okay if I teach them? He said, sure, teach them. And then they began to kick me. <laughs> the path. Without my umbrella, I forget the rain. Welcome each drop to forget me. The stones take more time to know their separate grooves and slopes Different slanting into the light, one face for the moon, one face for the clouds. In the wetness I hear honeysuckles tipping over at the edges, a frog jumping to reach the higher grass, lost somehow. At the end, I put my hand out to touch what love left for me the last time I came searching alone. With the umbrella I stumble, too lonesome for the way water soaks into the skin and the thunder, listening for the sound of the eagles circling above the lost children of wild pigs or what can be caught and carried in the talon. My hands are not free, too busy with trying to keep the cover on my head. The stones have another meditation, a kind of counting to music. Touch me, they say, and a thousand stone paths will make their way to me. Once in the night when it was dry, when the pretty rain of mountain springtime was suspended, I walked this path to the dream of where we live. at Lake Montebello with James. With the epigraph from Stevie Wonder, 
living just enough, just enough for the city. It is the shared surface of water that reminds us of being human, the invisible connectedness that freezes as one, melts as one, lays itself open in the sun to be a mirror, one vast or tiny glass. The articulate embroidery of shame is the curse of taking breath, leaving out of the infinite space of spirit to come into this elaborate rhythm and blues, the precious gifts, the shortcomings. We must hold the silver thimble on the thumb, so mend our way back over our lives to make sense of what happened to us while we both had to bear this cross with the gifts of music. The ecumenical shaft of light comes down into the car when you start to cry, going back to what happened to both of us in different places, the thing that happens to boys everywhere. Everywhere is the carelessness of God, his way of letting things slip so that the world will collapse as it should one day and then rise back into a testimony for hope, for life, I take the steering wheel with both hands, let the tears accumulate, hold them for private wailing sessions, like the ones I have now, the lake's joggers jiggling past the window. In Good Samaritan Hospital, my father is in the hospice swimming down under in the deep tide of strokes, failing organs, the blossoming of memories into dreams. I take the elevator on the ground, see a figure a hobbling on a cane to the door. My uncle, his eyes bright survivors of heart attacks and back operations, of accidentally shooting his leg playing quick draw, amusing himself. I hold the door open so we can ascend. He has the same way of smiling at a nephew he has loved in ways he cannot understand. This is a test of the elevator of moldy accounting books in the hands of the judges where patient spiders crawl into lampshades that light the darkened corners of our lives. A test of the weight on the cables of this thing, the switches that move the current into place, sending invisible messengers to light buttons Count the floors going up into the throat, a hollow space in this building, this charity. We are on the floor, walking together, me looking to give him space, but not so much that he fall, the arm and cane failing the dance of joint to helping stick, until we are down the hallway, a surprise in the air, a surprise when we turn, and my father's failed eye opens to the bloody space of his ending to let him know rage will not overtake me, rob me here where death's rattle is music. I owe a debt, a lifelong debt to Chinese culture and, and something that big, you cannot name any single individual, but I'd like to give a special thanks to my teacher, and he asked me to be more discreet in saying so, but I can say thank you to my teacher. Evening Lounge, after the painting by Brent Lynch. The humid nights are best and worst, best because the birds sing at two in the morning when you cannot get back into the other world, worst because it is the moist heat that makes the skin supple makes you want to rub against someone else, a woman. And there is nothing but the long list of lost chances, things you could have said, perhaps the simple question of, will you sleep with me? So that it is not just you in this shell of a home, this place where it feels the walls are another layer of my skin, and that is neither best or worst. It is the holding of the dead stink, the memories that wash over me, holding them back. It is the utter singleness of being the only person here, 
the way the thoughts think themselves down to accepting that this is really just me here wondering who I am, just me here wondering why I am awake at two, which trigger it was, knowing all the time all too well the way the war of life is connected to the nervous system of the world, the ganglia of our shared horrors, either mine so large or so people tell me. And here it seems to be the membrane between the skin of my bones and the skin of this home, the absorbing shock of space that gives when the memories burn their way in or out of me. I would lie here wondering how to tell her I am wrestling with the angel, wrestling with memories and the crevices and cracks of my body of how I feel right now, what it felt like then in those times, and I am glad she is not here. And I wish she were here, and she has no name because this is some woman I do not know. I practice in the silence of my thoughts the different pitch and rhythm of how I might ask, will you sleep with me? Afraid of what to say, should she say yes? And this decade of my monkish life should lie open and I have to say why I am sitting on the edge of the bed, why I have woke her from the sweet smile I assume she has when I assume her horror is smaller than mine. I was in junior high school when I began to have extreme dissociation or out-of-body experiences, and I never told anyone until I was in my late 40s in therapy. And um, I was concerned, as I was, about keeping up my grades, and I was afraid that if I went to school out of my body, I might fail the test. Flying. A hand pulled me open down on the bed, down on the bed, looking up, holding the covers while the soft soul of me, like a crab's inedible meat, lifted away and meet with thick strings that hold together, then elongate themselves to keep me tied, bound in the body until this lifting, the soul's ugly meat becoming wings, and I flew above the house, the graves behind it in Baltimore Cemetery with Grandma's marker holding our names, the ceiling was the law saying stop until the hand gave me the gift of flying. In my heart, yes, it is the heart, night became a magnet of my craving to be one thing forming in the womb of my mother where nascent nubs of self take shape, the brain still asleep in its mysteries until the heart awakens, thumps itself into beating with a drum song we know and the endless connections of intestines and brain, mind of gut, mind. The sages say we can fly when God falls asleep, his arm hitting the floor we call earth so the touched can dream of home. So I, when I was working on this book over a period of several years, I was concerned about um, breaking a cultural code that I was raised with, which is, you know, African Americans, and um, as a result, I think of the um, uh, year, many uh, decades and of separation and segregation that we we keep our private affairs to ourselves. And I, but I thought that this time to talk. This poem is entitled 1963, and uh, in working on this book, I thought also of the weight of the social trauma versus the personal, and um, I think they actually take turns being heavier. But this is 1963. It was the pair of light blue pants from Sears that smelled like petroleum, the pennies the white boys threw at us to see if we were really monkeys and would pick them up the long bus ride home to our side of things with people saying nigger. That September after Dr. King marched to Washington, after our Sunday picnics in parks where there seemed to be no war. 
the clouds perfect rolls of baby blue and white through the trees over the crabs and chicken and pies. That autumn it began, it seemed, the feelings that were memories, the flying out of things, soaring above the earth without my body, a premature angel as I knew them, except I was black in the mirrors, black of blackness that left me dizzy on the playground, pennies all around me, tap dancing to music from pain shooting through me from the memories of being used like a toy by faces now masked, demons far more evil than little white boys. And so I think I will close with the um, title poem to the collection, The Government of Nature, which actually refers to a 16th century Taoist map of the body. And um, is, it shows the body, the interior of the body, as being a replication of the world of nature, of mountains and waterfalls and so on. It's a reference to that. Um, the book, the title, of course, The Government of Nature, Dear Body of Mine. Rosetta Stone of my soul, familiar vasellum, I have brought you to the arbor of memories in the clinging vines playing Negro spirituals for parakeets with mouths turned upward as we were when we came into the world, me a sheaf of unwritten contracts, you a chemistry wrestled out of love and fate, dear body of mine, organs and nerves, vessels, pineal window to inner space, the intersections of visions. What abbreviated paternoster do we summon in the night when the hand upturns the sacred portion of a child and mixes the nerves to make monsters, uses them for what feels unnatural, abridges and aborts the will, or is it the will itself come down to the only path that will let us be the difficult unknown in the calculus that is our test along the way to forgetting? As we agree to this, to the pain, the crying out for mother as trusted hands molest the child split from the herd to bind it with karma until the Dhammapada nods the way to nirvana. I come with you to places I cannot go alone. As alone, I would be only the decision to be, not the things I cannot explain to anyone, except in the privacy of a piety I've had to own, a profane saintliness that came to me in places too foul to remain buried in me. These places, lotus ponds, mountains, waterfalls, divine insignia and closets, bedrooms, bathrooms, these places of carnival I now name as redemption, sins multiplying, lifting the eyes of cumulus clouds, praying over the urges that rise from memories of rape, the loneliness kept in grace's silence. Dear body of mine, I push off from a knowing that tears my eyes into a steady stream, leaving the medulla a tuft of grass on a hill looking up and out to the wise fool in the center of the mind as wishes fall back from the perimeters of the skin beneath to the bone inside the marrow to pierce the centers of cells until knowing leaves us tender and mortal desire a river longing itself into being lost in mirrors. Thank you.